Holy sh**. It would take a year to find something in here. I don't know where to find this bloody stuff. Look at this little fake horse. Probably stuff in its butt or something. Guys do stupid stuff like that. A couple months ago, I stated that Age of Extinction is where the Transformers franchise finally hit rock bottom. But what I'm here to state today is that the point where the franchise began digging into the ground to destroy itself for good is 2017's The Last Night. What was that? That was a mistake. The best way to describe The Last Night is that it's basically Age of Extinction, but worse. As in, a couple variables aside, it's mostly the same interchangeable movie. We enter a world where the Transformers are hunted by the government and follow our Texas hero Kate Yeager as he goes on a fugitive journey with Autobots through deserts and alien spaceships to stop this Transformers MacGuffin from turning the Earth into something Transformers related. Or as a metaphorical example of this, we get the exact same product of Michael Bay Triple B filmmaking, only this time one of those bees being a bit different. And because of that, what we're gonna be doing here today is reinforcing what we did in that video on Age of Extinction. Highlight the main problems with Michael Bay as a filmmaker. One, so that we can clearly see that those problems weren't just an isolated one-off occurrence, but something that he increasingly brings into every movie he makes now. And two, if Michael Bay can save time and effort by recycling the same stuff he's done before, so can I. Again though, joking aside, the point here isn't to try and make Michael Bay feel bad or whatever, but just to further recognize his main faults as a filmmaker and how those faults can potentially be fixed. Still not that I think he's gonna be watching this because based on his Instagram he keeps having better things to do. Look at that arm, that arm is like, it's like bigger than rocks. Look at him, we'll give you the hero shot. But just hopefully, if we force this into the universe, the universe will... Uh, the universe will be forced to do something about it. And so, here once again are the main problems with Michael Bay as a filmmaker and how those problems manifest themselves in The Last Night. Here is how Michael Bay's inner demons in 10 years grew so strong that they ended up destroying and dismantling the entire Transformers franchise. Firstly, there's the issue of Michael Bay's signature goofy superficial tone that here has grown so incredibly strong that it's preventing this film from feeling like anything. On one side, this means that pretty much every character in here is the exact same character, the absurdly goofy comic relief. Whether it's a little goofy kid or a random goofy guy or a bunch of goofy old ladies. If I was looking for a BBW, I don't know what that is. It's a car, dear. Big, beautiful woman. Is it? And on the other side, it means that the world here is as if ADHD had somehow developed a physical form. The best exemplifying example of this being the junkyard sequence meant to introduce Kate Yeager's new ordinary fugitive life, in which there's more sh** going on than in your usual blockbuster finale. We have missiles going off for no reason. Damn, forgot about that cluster bomb. We have robots fighting for some reason. We have dinosaurs eating police cars for a reason. Cruiser, you know, grenades going off, near-death experiences, Transformer flies, heated arguments about nothing, Kate's house catching fire without him even caring. Basically, if you suffer from anxiety easily, it's impossible for you to watch this. And as I said last time, neither of these sides is anything new to Michael Bay, because he knows he makes movies for kids and so wants those movies to be fun, and that's fine. But the issue is that this goofy fun mentality has grown so much that it's become actual poison to what his movies are doing. On the world side, it straight up ruins the emotions that these scenes and situations are built on. In a later junkyard scene, for example, we have this highly emotional beat where Kate calls his daughter Tessa that he as a fugitive has had to leave behind. Which is emotionally crippled by the fact that Michael Bay just had to have big robots cracking jokes right there beside him. It's here's a big boy zone. Another example, at the beginning we have this massive gloomy middle ages battle that's about to make humanity destroy itself, with our only hope being the wizard Merlin who's on a heroic race to save humanity. Until... Oh, one last nip. <laughs> if I could, for one moment, change this world for the better. I would give up everything, everything, 
I'd give up drink, money, win, drinking money. And watching the movie in full, you'll see that this happens again and again. When characters sacrifice themselves for others, turns out they didn't. It's only been back, dude. When we're in the middle of a highly intense escape from Decepticons and police, turns out we aren't. Agnes called. Wondered if you're available for a bit of a snuggle this evening. I'll never snuggle with Agnes. Do I look available? Anytime we're about to do something relating to some specific emotion, Michael Bay jumps in to... You ruined the moment again. I was making the moment more epic. Just be quiet. What's the matter with you? On the character side, on the other hand, this fun mentality not only makes every character the same, but also ruins the cores of what they are. I already covered Cade and the other characters in the last video, and nothing about them has changed here. But I'll give you a couple new examples. One of our new heroes is this British woman, who actually has a pretty good introduction. Her horse polo match shows that she's industrious and tenacious. Her thematic Oxford lecture shows that she's smart and sophisticated. But in between these constructive character scenes, there's also one tiny signature MB haha moment that kinda undoes most of that. It might not seem like a big deal on the surface, but the reason this joke of the British woman bumping into the bikes is so harmful is because it consciously makes us think less of her. Suddenly, when we're watching the woman introduce the movie's emotion-based theme, we don't take her or that theme seriously, because we just saw she can't even drive a car. And I genuinely don't understand why this joke has to be here. Like, was it really so funny that it was worth doing at the cost of putting your new hero down and making us view her as just another car? comic relief goofball. Or take the character of Anthony Hopkins, a comic relief so goofy it quickly grows to the point of utter nonsense. I mean, battle of the Mind, Battle of the Sun, Battle of the Mind, Battle of Passion Day, Trenches, and it's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. No, but um, it's, um, it's terrible. I mean, it's so sad, you know, but I mean... What's going on here? Well, after two hours of quirky, nonsensical goofiness, Anthony Hopkins finally at the end gets a chance to reveal his actual emotional core, when he sacrifices himself in order to give humanity a fighting chance, in a moment of purpose he's been waiting for, for years. I had it, Cogman. I had my moment. But then, just before this highly emotional moment finishes... Of all the Earls I have had the pleasure to serve, you were by far the coolest. Right, we just had to throw in one last ironic teenage haha about this distinguished old British knight being cool. And it's like, was it really necessary? Couldn't you just this once let this character have his dignity without turning it into something juvenile? Maybe it's not a big issue on its own, but when this is the norm that happens again and again and again, a big issue is what it becomes. And that's what I... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. And that's what I wish so much that Michael Bay would change. Your movies can be fun, Michael, but not everything in your movies has to be funny. Because nothing feels like anything when everything is a joke. Secondly, as Michael Bay's clout has grown, so has his tendency to do whatever he wants with plot and characters, regardless of whether it makes any sense or breaks the whole experience. On the plot side, not even touching on the fact that in every movie there seems to be a new discovered reason and time period that Transformers have arrived on Earth, you'll notice that the plot here is basically a middle finger to most of what we did a couple years ago. The whole point of the fourth entry was to stop a section of government from hunting Transformers regardless of side, and for Kate Yeager to get his life back after becoming a fugitive. Well, guess what? Where are the others? The ones you're hiding. Hey, the military doesn't want it this way, B. You gotta believe that. It's a new world order now and these guys are calling the shots. Whose side are you on? They're all bad. Right, there's a section of government hunting Transformers regardless of side, and Cade is, once again, a fugitive. Kinda nullifies most of Age of Extinction, but this is what Michael Bay wants to do now, so whatever. We don't have a home, Dad. He blew up. I might be able to help you with that. 
As for the actual plot, it obviously of course divides into a few different ones. The first hour is like Transformers 4.5, where characters from the last movie just hide out at a junkyard without any purpose, and after being found, decide to stay in this deserted town to fight both Decepticons and humans instead of just running away for some reason, because that's what Michael Bay feels like doing. And after that hour, Michael Bay then tosses most of those characters away like a kid bored with old toys and flies only Kate and Bumblebee to England to have this Middle Ages plot. A plot that involves a MacGuffin without a clear established power, as well as ancient evils approaching both from the ground and space to the point where it's not sure which villain we're supposed to fight in this movie and which in the next. And then there's also a massive endgame finale, which I'll say does handle visual scale very well. Plus a couple more other subplots. So, you know, your basic 4 to 5 full movies crammed into one, which I already talked about in the last video. On the character side, the crux is the same. Remember how at the end of Age of Extinction, Optimus Prime left on this heroic mission so that the Earth can be safe? Well... Without leaders, chaos reigns. Oh, what we would all give to have Prime back right now. Remember all that stuff about humans gathering precious Transformer metal to build their own Transformers and Megatron being reincarnated as Galvatron with his new manufactured army? Well, Michael Bay clearly didn't because that army and technology is now just gone and even Galvatron is Megatron again, except not the Megatron from the earlier movies somehow. Which mainly just makes you confused as to how some stuff has been rebooted while other hasn't. But again, that's what MB felt like doing this time, so whatever. We are not rebooting Megatron. Not letting him out, no. I mean, you know, I mean, we can be flexible. And the same goes on and on. We have Stanley Tucci playing Merlin, which is quite weird because he played the tech CEO in the last movie. But I guess it's a nod that he's Merlin's descendant, so makes sense. Until it then turns out that Merlin Stanley Tucci's descendant isn't actually Stanley Tucci, but instead this new British woman, who seemingly has no ties to Stanley Tucci whatsoever. And so apparently Stanley Tucci plays Merlin just because Michael Bay felt like casting Stanley Tucci, regardless of how confusing it might be. Might get. Whatever. We have robots who get shot on sight for being robots, and at the same time other robots who get locked in prison for robbing banks. In for bank robbery. We have Hound staying behind to die for no real reason other than it looks cool. Until he magically then returns at the end as if the movie suddenly just changed its mind about his death. We have a brainwashed Optimus Prime showing up for five minutes toward the end to fight Bumblebee, who then at the last moment snaps him out of it with this really emotional character beat. Bumblebee, your voice. I have not heard it since Cybertron fell. Which is mainly again just confusing because Bumblebee already spoke to Optimus in the first movie. Permission to speak, sir. Permission granted. Old friend. You speak now? I'm not gonna go through the whole thing and you can watch the earlier video for more, but the point I'm getting at is that there's no consistency to anything that happens here and instead it's this one big nonsensical hodgepodge of every single incompatible thing that Michael Bay felt like doing. And again, I really hope he finds someone who dares to tell him no. No, you can't have multiple movies in one. No, you can't have characters behave in ways that goes against how you've established them before. Because when you do whatever you want and feel like, even things that don't fit together in any way, odds are that you'll just either confuse the audience or break the whole experience by pulling the audience out of it. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's my girlfriend has this thing she really wants me to buy and I'll just do it now out of the way, whatever. Won't take long guys, I'll just go and... Oh, f***ing Christ, I have to get my... I have to go find my credit card info. God damn it, this is gonna take a while, guys. Sorry. Actually, hold on, I should have it stored up here. Yeah, yeah. So if I try now, it should autofill all of it for me, right? There we go. <laughs> Problem solved. Oh, and because I'm sure you're wondering now, I'm using NordPass to store all my logins and credit card info so I can just have all of it autofill for me when I'm logging into places or buying stuff. I'm really bad with remembering passwords and usernames and all that stuff across all these different websites, so this makes life a lot easier. And that's pretty random, actually, because NordPass is actually sponsoring today's video with a nice Filmento premium winter sale of 70% off with one extra month for free. So if you're tired of forgetting and reacquiring your passwords or having to manually 
manually fill up logins and payment details, click the link below and you'll only have to worry about logging into one place. A place that keeps everything safely encrypted and organized across all your devices and this way saves a bunch of time. So anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I do have a real girlfriend. Finally, that's the issue that Michael Bay as a filmmaker genuinely no longer cares about the quality of his movies or what you think about them, which manifests itself in the lack of integrity, enthusiasm, and passion. For integrity, luckily this time around there's no ultra-nationalistic propaganda, because in here we go to England, which isn't as insecure about how it gets portrayed as certain other countries. And overall, the propaganda here doesn't go beyond the typical whichever car brand pays the most. Whoa, I love this car! What you will notice about The Last Night, however, is that it was very eager to capitalize on the female empowerment movement that was ramping up at the time with Wonder Woman. We have this young, strong orphan character Isabella who is initially given center stage. She's our introductory anchor into this world and she even got her own full dedicated trailer that promised a very specific type of movie. But when it came to actually doing something with her, Michael Bay had other ideas. You out of your mind? You're not going anywhere with me! Right, after the first hour of Transformers 4.5, Isabella gets pretty much tossed away for good so that we can instead move on with Kate as our sole primary lead and pair him up with a new really hot Michael Bay Bay. I'm not saying you had to give Isabella a bigger role here because we did get the Bumblebee movie later on, but I am saying that you can't just try to capitalize on a movement without then actually somehow progressing that movement because the audience will see through it. You gotta go. You can't stay here. That's only if you have the integrity to care though. As for the lack of enthusiasm, it basically means that Michael Bay has no care left to even try anymore. When he wants to have a big desert town battle with gunfights and explosions and Star Wars thrones, he puts no effort into logically justifying why the heroes are stopping to fight instead of just escaping or why their trap is at this random never before seen town instead of their home base or why any of this is even happening. It just is what it is. Or when he wants to introduce a new batch of villains, he'll skip actually building and developing those villains and instead just look to the latest blockbuster that made a bunch of money and copy paste that. Okay. And last but not least, Captain Boomerang. It's one thing to improve upon something that has worked well before and another to see the dollar signs on the new hot thing nobody even enjoyed and put 40% effort into recycling what it did. Like yeah, this other thing made some money so let's just take a bunch of evil robots with recycled visuals and slap a bunch of text on them. That's more than enough. And then lastly, there's Michael Bay's lack of passion, which you can notice by literally just not closing your eyes. You know how when other self-respecting filmmakers flip between aspect ratios, they try to be as gentle and inconspicuous about it as possible, not to let it come at the cost of distracting the audience? Well, yeah. <laughs> Michael Bay doesn't care about your distraction, he doesn't care about your headache. If he happened to film 20 shots in 20 different aspect ratios, you can be f***ing sure he's gonna use every single one. Like whether it's making frames incompatible, whether it's leaving extra stuff in the frames, despite all the loud criticism he gets, Michael Bay has no filmmaking passion left to give a sh**. And again, I really genuinely hope he learns to listen and changes from that. Because for the first time in a long time, his untreated issues have finally begun to catch up with him. Whether that change actually ever happens, that's up to the universe or I guess Mr. Bayhem himself to decide. Although honestly, at this point, I'm not so sure which of them will be easier to convince.